We are taking you now live to Ottawa, where Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie is speaking. Let's take a listen. Uh, candidacy to be part of the Human Rights Council of the UN for generations. Canada has had a strong voice, an important voice for the respective human rights throughout the world. We were when Canadian diplomats were um, wrote the U United Declaration of Human Rights in 1947, and we are still today. By supporting the rights of women and girls, by fighting for the rights of Indigenous populations, LGBTQ plus communities, and those with disabilities, Louise Arbeau, this great Canadian, Defender of Human Rights played a key role in the creation of the Human Rights Council of the UN, and it's time that Canada become a member again. This is how we show our commitment towards multilateralism and towards the supporting values with concrete um, things. We know the Council has challenges. Certain actors are trying to use this forum not to progress human rights, but to repress them. This is exactly why Canada must be at the table to add our voice to all those that continue to fight for human rights and to counter disinformation. We're not perfect and we're working every day to become better. And while we continue to work to address our own challenges, in particular as it relates to rebuilding our relationship with Indigenous peoples, and Minister Miller will be able to talk about this, we'll remain a champion for human rights around the world. Canada's candidacy is based on six priorities. The first one, we'll seek justice and accountability for those who are bravely working at the front lines to defend human rights, so protecting the, uh, human rights defenders. Second, we will strive for an inclusive future and champion anti-racism and freedom of religious belief. Third, we'll continue working towards the recognition and realization of the rights of Indigenous peoples, both at home and around the world. Fourth, we will also work to advance gender equality, building on our feminist foreign policy, and I know Harj and I have been working a lot on this, and looking to the next generation of rights, ensuring we are at the table to help them uh, and shape them uh, as uh, we are uh, defining them. And of course, we'll always defend women's right to choose at home and abroad. Fifth, which is something that is novel, is the question of the online space and new technologies uh, that are creating new threats to human rights. So as we will advance on digital inclusion, safe online spaces, we need to make sure that people online and also when it comes to using AI are protected and that these technologies don't hurt human rights. And finally, climate change, which affects the ability of every human on Earth to access a safe and prosperous life, we must act. And of course, as migration flows increase around the world, we'll always stand up for the rights of migrants. From the effects of climate change to gender equality, we will keep the rights of migrants front and center as we advance these six priorities. Donc, notre campagne repose sur six so Our campaign is based on six fundamental priorities, supporting the human rights defenders, build an inclusive future without discrimination, reconciliation with indigenous populations, progressing gender equality, protecting human rights online, and also everything to do with AI and fight against climate change. We'll be able to bring a more just tomorrow by achieving new milestones in human rights. Donc, merci beaucoup, et ça me fait plaisir de passer la parole maintenant à mon collègue Harj Sajjan. Let my colleague uh, Harjan speak. Thank you, Mel. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm also proud to join my colleagues in announcing our candidacy for the United Nations Human Rights Council. Now, under our feminist international assistance policy, Canada has committed to take a human rights-based and inclusive approach in all of our international assistance. Human rights-based approach focuses on empowering the most marginalized people around the world. Now, this means developing their capacity to know how to exercise and to claim their rights. Their current um, the, the current state of uh, climate change, gender equality, human rights have combined to challenge people already living in vulnerable situations. And we also know uh, the most serious impacts of these issues falls on women and girls and all their diversity. 
Uh, we also know that the focusing on empowering women and girls benefits all genders, families, and communities. Canada's Feminist International Assistance Policy guides our development and humanitarian efforts all over the world. The International Assistance Policy is at its heart inclusive. Now, this is why we have uh, programming that supports women's uh, economic empowerment, promoting a woman's leadership, promoting sexual and reproductive health rights all over the world, and combat uh, combating gender-based violence. Now, this is why we have programming to strengthen democratic institutions with a focus on protecting the rights of marginalized and vulnerable populations, supporting electoral processes, supporting human rights monitoring, and supporting access to justice. This is why we are committed to promoting and protecting the rights of two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, and intersex people around the world. Now, de uh, also decriminalization of uh, homosexuality, promoting uh, 2S LGBTI plus rights, and combating discrimination and violence uh, based on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Now, for the past seven years, we have put our feminist international assistance policy into action, promoting a human rights-based society. Uh, we are also promoting an open, inclusive society. And as we aspire uh, to contribute to a safer, more sustainable, and prosperous feminist, feminist world where everyone is treated with dignity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. And I'll pass it over to Minister Miller. Hello. Bonjour, thank you to Minister Jolie for inviting me to participate in this announcement. And thanks to everyone for joining us on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Ishmael people. Um, let me say that Canada. Minister Jolie is completely right about Canada. Um, the rights Not only uh, has... Canada specifically established colonial policies to deprive Indigenous peoples of their language, culture, land, and even human safety. Across the world, Indigenous peoples have similar histories, tainted by discrimination, racism, and inequality. We should not be afraid to speak about this on the world stage, as painful as this is. Regardless of what some people might believe, this is Canada's history, it's the world's history, and it's Canada's truth, it's our truth. One that our government is working to address through policies and initiatives and reparations that will last for generations. We will not manage to become inclusive in Canada and we will not be able to be an inclusive partner if we don't give a priority to the UN Declaration on the Indigenous Peoples in a spirit of reconciliation. It's a moral obligation, not only to the Government of Canada and every one of my colleagues, not only to every Canadian, but to every country in the world. It's not linear, it comes at a cost when based on truth concrete actions, healing, and importantly, financial commitment. We still have a lot of work to do, and we've learned a lot from our Indigenous partners. There's still a lot of work to be done. We are continuously uh, engaged to reconciliation and address the colonialism that still have an impact on Indigenous communities, as, and also... ...understanding that Canada promotes human rights, I'm confident that Canada would promote rights, perspectives, and priorities of Indigenous peoples at the table. For far too long, Indigenous peoples have been denied the most basic of rights to live freely and fully on their own land. So I fully support this bid, and it's time to make their voices heard as imperfectly as a person like me can do it, not only in Canada, but internationally. Miigwech, Kuyanamik, Marci, merci, and thank you. What have we learned from the UN Security Council bid that we can apply in this situation to actually succeed? Well, first and foremost, I think we've learned that uh, we need to make sure that we're uh, taking the time and uh, making sure that also we uh, show up and that we have a strong voice within the UN and within the entire multilateral system. Um, as I mentioned a bit earlier, um, there, are, there is a clear backlash happening around the world as we speak when it comes to human rights. And we just can't stand idle, just screaming from uh, you know, the sides, saying basically that we should be doing something without rolling up our sleeves and getting involved, because we need to uh, make sure that uh, we unstack the, de the deck. And uh, by uh, um, working all together as a government, and I hope with all Canadians, uh, I think we can definitely win this, and I'm confident 
ambitious and humble at the same time. You mentioned at many different times during your speeches the importance of defending women's rights. We remember that in your budget, the government cut 15% of budgets for organizations helping women's rights on an international stage. So we know we're very far from the 2% of NATO of what Canada should supply. Is that really an example of leadership? Can you show up to the UN saying we are now champions of women's rights and we fill our NATO responsibilities? I think those are two questions. When we're talking about the question at the UN of the involvement of Canada throughout the world, it's different to our investments for um, defending our security. So if I'm just taking your question on the basis of the role of Canada in the world, we will always be there to invest in our in our policy of feminist uh, development. We'll also be there to invest more on the multilateral system in the UN to increase our rights. As I was saying in English, there is really a, a backing up of human rights throughout the world. There's a lot of countries on the council and we need to make sure as a country who is not perfect, who always wants to do better, but who believes in human rights to be there at the table. Um, for too long, Canada hasn't been at the table of the council. There are important decisions, important investigations, and we need to be there to have our voices heard. And we need to work as well with countries who, like us, share the importance of human rights, but also countries where maybe we don't have the same vision of things, but we think that by working together, we're able to have progress for humans throughout the world. There were other MPs that have been targeted by China. When will those MPs get briefings? When will that knowledge be shared with them? So first and foremost, when it comes to foreign interference, you've heard me and you've heard the Minister of Public Safety and the Prime Minister will never accept it. And that's why we took a very important decision. And I answered many questions this morning about it. And that, you know, we expelled uh, the Toronto uh, concert, uh, uh, Mr. Wei, a bit earlier uh, this week. Now, uh, that being said, regarding your very question, as you know, there is uh, uh, a... Uh, process that has been put in place uh, by uh, the Prime Minister. There is a special rapporteur and I know also that the Minister of Public Safety is looking into this very closely. At the same time, also, you heard the Prime Minister that there is an investigation that has been launched uh, to make sure to, to see, uh, all, to, to shed light on the issue. So what does CSIS know about more? Is this up to CSIS now? Is this up to this invest investigation to move forward with this? Is this, we have to wait till the 23rd of May? So, like, I, I, Kevin, when will I, MPs I know? Hear, I hear questions, and I know that you're keen on getting an answer. Of course, I'm the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs, and my job is to answer on the question of foreign affairs. And I work closely with my dear colleague, the Minister of Public Safety. CSIS is under his responsibility, and he's the most tool to be able to answer your questions. Sur le projet de loi de Madame... The legislation of Mrs. Wargenthal on abort, well, it's not really abortion, but she suggests that the law take into consideration that a pregnant woman, if she's victim of a crime, that the judge uh, uses that as an aggravating circumstance when establishing the sentence. There's no mention of fetuses in the legislation, but we know that she's presented legislation in the past where she wanted to criminalize, for example, the fact that a fetus would be hurt or killed in utero. What do you think of that legislation? Well, there's no surprise. Every session, the Conservative Party, who is close uh, to the anti-abortion movement, trying to create a, a breach to, you know, push back women's rights in the country. We've seen it. They are inspired by what's happening in the U.S. They try to import it into Canada. Certain of the tactics and strategies that are set in on the south of the border. And again, we're seeing this as a different way to make sure to deny rights to women. So we're trying to do it through the back door, which essentially yeah, anti-abortion groups are trying to do in the country. We've seen it. I've said it this weekend at, during the conference. There's a growth of the radical right in the country. We need to be there to stop it and we'll be there as a feminist government to ensure we protect the right of abortion throughout the country. 
when this no, but, but exactly, 